it's always a privilege to uh, collaborate with uh, my colleagues and confreres in Rome. My way of approaching uh, these texts has been shaped by uh, my mentor, uh, Father Serve Pinkers. So we're going to begin by looking at what Aquinas himself had to look at uh, the scripture, uh, the the uh, the texts of scripture, and also some of the uh, the reflections that were offered by Augustine, which. I think drew out some of the best and deepest reflections that Aquinas had on the virtues. Uh, so, and I will shrink myself back down again, not quite that small. And we can begin uh, with uh, 1 Peter. St. Peter tells us to always be ready to respond to anyone who asks you to account for the hope that is in you. But what is hope? What exactly? Uh, does it mean to hope? Uh, when we turn to the Old Testament, we discover that uh, the standard English versions of the scriptures imply uh, the word hope. Let me see if I can advance my text here. Um, yeah, so the standard English versions of the scriptures employ the word hope to translate a broad but related spectrum of Hebrew words used to convey aspects uh, of our relationship with the Lord. Uh, sometimes uh, hope uh, translates Hebrew verbs that convey the notion of trusting or seeking refuge and safety in the Lord. Uh, for example, King Hezekiah is described as one who hoped in the Lord, the God of Israel. At other times, hope signifies an act of patiently waiting for the Lord or awaiting him with eager expectation, uh, often uh, translating um, words, uh, Hebrew words that originally signify, again, if I can make this go forward, um, originally signified uh, a cord used to bind things together. Hope, is, hope thus conveys something of the heart's attachment to the Lord. Uh, be strong, let your heart take courage, uh, all you who hope in the Lord, from Psalm 16. Or we could have Jeremiah uh, 17, uh, 7. Um, uh, the blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. I'm having problems here with my teleprompter. There we go. Uh, when the first translators of the Old Testament into English chose the Germanic word hope to translate the diverse, uh, this diverse group of words, they were following along in a long tradition begun by the Jewish rabbis at Alexandria, who translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek during the three centuries that preceded the birth of Jesus a translation that uh, came, uh, became known as the work of the 70 or the Septuagint uh, from the Latin for 70. The rabbis at Alexandria usually employed the Greek word elpis to translate this range of Hebrew terms. While in pagan Greek religion, elpis, like her equivalent among the Roman gods, spes, was a goddess from whom one expected good things, for Plato and Aristotle and Greek philosophy generally, Elpis conveyed a more neutral emotion of expectation, whether of good things or bad things. In relation to good things, Elpis conveyed both expectation and an ardent desire that this, that uh, it thus served well to convey the biblical expectation variously conveyed in Hebrew. Importantly, for the Christian understanding of hope, the Septuagint does not merely contain translations of the Hebrew scriptures. It also contains the work of inspired biblical authors who wrote their books originally in Greek. These books are especially important for the theology of hope for on the eve of the birth of Christ, they helped clarify the object and meaning of biblical hope. The Hebrew scriptures had made it clear that God was the object of our hope. He was our strength 
and our Savior, whose help and protection we should desire and await with patience. What exactly, however, was, his, was he saving us from? And what exactly were we desiring to attain? It was only when the Jews were forced to confront Greek culture and when they began to suffer, not because of their infidelity, but because of their heroic fidelity to the Lord, that the occasion arose for the Lord to deepen their understanding of hope. The second book of Maccabees, for example, oops, we'll get back to that. The second book of Maccabees, for example, uh, a book originally re written in Greek, both tells the story of Jewish resistance to the Seleucid Greeks who were imposing pagan practices upon them. So it not only tells that story, it also engages Greek culture by employing the language uh, of the Greeks to express Israel's hopes. The story of the seven sons who were tortured and killed before their grieving mother expresses clearly the object of the Maccabees' hope. To understand the power of their dying proclamations, we should contrast it with another deathbed proclamation of hope. So now we can move on to our next uh, citation. Plato in the Phaedo describes Socrates as awaiting death uh, by engaging in a discussion about the immortality of the soul. First, he has Socrates express his hope. Uh, let's see if I can do this again. I'm having one more difficulty with my pointer here to make my, let's see here, I can, this is really gonna be annoying if this keeps happening. This technology is good, but not perfect. Here we go. Uh, so Plato describes Socrates as awaiting death by engaging in a discussion about the immortality of the soul. First, he has Socrates expressed his hope. I hope to join the company of good men, uh, a quite remarkable uh, affirmation. Uh, and then he further affirms uh, that I have good hope, eu elpis, that some future awaits men after death. Essential to his argument, is that the body is a hindrance uh, to life after death, or at least a life of happy contemplation. So Socrates uh, will explain uh, that as long as we have the body, our soul, and our soul is fused with such an evil, that is the body, we shall never adequately, adequately attain what we desire. Only when we are dead, shall we attain that which we desire and of which we uh, claim to be lovers, namely wisdom. Socrates' hope, therefore, is in death itself. That death will liberate him from the body, which he describes as an evil hindrance. The hope of the Maccabees could not be more different. Uh, the first son uh, dies uh, with this on his lips, the Lord uh, will have compassion on his servants. While the second son asserts that the king of the world will, the king of the world will raise up an everlasting reward of eternal life. To make it clear that this renewal of life, anabiosis zoes, refers to a bodily resurrection, the third son proclaims, referring to his tongue and hands that were about to be chopped off, it was from heaven that I received these. For the sake of his laws, I disdain them. From him, I hope to receive them again. As for the grieving mother, the narrator tell, informs us that she bore these deaths uh, because of her hope in the Lord. Okay, we'll already give that. I didn't give you the mother's words, uh, but they are in 720. Unlike Socrates, therefore, 
who hopes that death will save him from the bondage of the body and lead him to the life of wisdom. The hope of the Maccabees is in the Lord who will lead them to a res resurrected life in the body. We should notice here the twofold structure of the Maccabees hope. They hope, desire to attain something, eternally resurrected life, and they hope, trust someone to help them attain it, that is, God, because of his mercy. God is both the object of their hope, to enjoy resurrected life with him, and the source of their hope. It is by his action that they will attain this goal. There is a further feature to Old Testament hope, the mysterious way the Lord will bring his people to this resurrected life. The example of Socrates can once again help us in this regard. Socrates was not wrong to desire wisdom, nor was he wrong to desire to live everlastingly with the good, uh, with the good, with good people uh, in the eternal contemplation of wisdom. He was wrong, however, about how to attain this twin goal. Death was not the means. As the Book of Wisdom affirms, God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. Uh, that's that quote that I've given you, which is beautiful. Uh, and he further affirms, uh, affirms uh, that, um, uh, that only justice is immortal. And it is by walking the way of justice that one attains eternal life, a way that is taught by wisdom itself. Therefore, the souls of the just uh, are in the hand of God, and their hope uh, is full of immortality. The Book of Wisdom goes on to describe the mysterious ways by which wisdom and the just one, the mysterious just one, will bring to fruition the Lord's saving plan for humanity, describing how the people were saved by wisdom. The prophet Isaiah also uh, refers, uh, the prophet Isaiah also refers to the mission of this mysterious savior in the first of his servant poems, which affirms that the servant will proclaim justice to the nations and in his name, the nations will hope. Matthew, in Matthew, if we shift to the New Testament, Matthew affirms that this prophecy is fulfilled in Christ. Uh, but it is St. Paul, as we shift to the New Testament uh, witness to hope, uh, it is St. Paul who is the true apostle of hope. When he arrives uh, in Rome, uh, he tells the Jews, uh, the Jewish community there, that it was on account of the hope of Israel that he has been uh, brought there in chains. Earlier, uh, before the Sanhedrin uh, in uh, Jerusalem, Paul proclaimed uh, the character of Israel's hope, stating, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, and I am on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And then uh, before Agrippa at Caesarea, he explains, uh, and I wish I could, I'll make this one a little bit bigger, but I'll have to, oh, I can't make it bigger. Anyway, uh, he explains, uh, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law or written in the prophets, having a hope in God, Elpis, which these themselves, that is his attackers, accept that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. What gets Paul's in trouble, therefore, with this group is his assertion that Israel's hope is fulfilled in Christ. Indeed, Paul describes Christ as our hope. Uh, this is how uh, the Pauline letter uh, of, how one Pauline letter uh, powerfully begins, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God, our savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Uh, Paul will apply uh, the root of Jesse, uh, the story about the root of Jesse in Isaiah 11:10 to Christ explicitly. In a passage, 
like the passage from Isaiah 42.4, employed by Matthew, in a passage that affirms that in him the nations shall hope. So Isaiah 42.4 and uh, Isaiah 11.10 10, 11, 10, both talk about the servant in whom the nations or in whose name the nations will hope. Although this hope is un, an, an unmerited gift, 2 Thessalonians 2.16, we are nonetheless encouraged to seize hold of it uh, as the anchor of our life uh, that will enable us to follow Christ into the Holy of Holies, Hebrews 6.19. It is in this hope that we become heirs of eternal life. We should note that this hope is communal. In hope, we become the house of God over which Christ, as the Son of God, is the faithful steward, Hebrews 3, 6. The object of hope is no earthly community, but God as the heavenly city. Therefore, we have no uh, lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come. As the apostle of grace, however, Paul goes beyond describing the object of our hope to reveal, so not just focusing on its object, he goes beyond this to reveal the mystery of its presence within us. First, he underlines its relationship with the two other mystery, mysterious gifts of grace, faith and charity. This relationship between faith, hope, and charity was already affirmed in the Old Testament, beautifully in the Book of Wisdom, in Ben Sirach, in some of the Psalms. But Paul makes the link even more explicit. Uh, so he famously affirms in his uh, hymn to love in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, uh, that uh, there are these three things abide, faith, hope, and charity but the greatest of these is charity. Paul calls us therefore in what is perhaps the oldest New Testament reference uh, to hope uh, to put on the breastplate, breastplate of faith and love and the helmet that is the hope of salvation. Once again, in language uh, that, is, uh, uh, that makes an echo to the language that one finds in the book of wisdom. In Romans, however, Paul delivers in five compact, compact verses an entire theology of what will become known uh, as the theological virtues. Uh, Romans 5, 1 through 5, and I'll get out of the way here. I'll make this bigger for us. Uh, so Romans uh, 5, 1 through 5 offers an entire theology of hope in relation to faith and charity. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce Suffering produces patient endurance, and patient endurance produces a proven character, and proven character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. There are several things to notice in this paragraph. First, it is Trinitarian. Paul refers to God, to Christ, and to the Holy Spirit. Second, it is through Christ that we receive the grace that enables us to stand before God in right relationship with him, to be justified, to become zedek in Hebrew, become able to walk in God's ways. Moreover, although it is through Christ, this action occurs in the spirit because the Holy Spirit has been poured into our hearts. In other words, the three theological virtues are deeply related to our participation in the triune life of God. Indeed, notice how Paul describes hope's object, to share in the glory of God. This hope is a cause of joy, but there is also the presence of suffering, which is somehow related to 
patient endurance. Paul employs the Greek term hupomone here, which Aristotle describes as the primary act of courage to bear patiently the sufferings and dangers of battle. That is what hupomone is, and that is what courage is. Paul elsewhere famously describes this as our way of participating in the sufferings of Christ. For Paul, this patient endurance, this courage leads to a proven character, which for Paul signifies the ability to walk in justice. So what begins by faith grows uh, through hope animated by love. It is not enough to be justified, placed in right relationship with God, become zedek. We must live justice, must live zedekah, walk and advance in this right relationship with God. In other words, by enduring patiently the sufferings of this life, we advance on the way to glory. Ultimately, however, for Paul, this progress becomes possible only because of the love of God that has been poured into our hearts through the action of his grace. We are thus called in Christ to live a faith that works through love, Galatians 5, 6. Paul famously articulates charity's priority when he affirms that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, patiently endures all things. Now, uh, we will get to that Augustinian quotation in a moment. Uh, so love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, patiently endures all things. Notice how patience endurance is once again linked to uh, the trilogy of faith, hope, and charity. Uh, it is as animated by charity that acts of faith and hope and even of courageous endurance obtain their true character and thus enable us to advance on our way to glory. Or as the tradition will affirm, faith and hope only become meritorious as animated by charity. Hope's relationship to love, however, leads us to one of its greatest mysteries. And it is here that Thomas Aquinas will make a lasting contribution to our theology of hope. Plato had described hope as something that is expressed by means of desire. The things we hope for, are the things we desire to attain. Charity too, however, seems to entail desire. St. Augustine, for example, will affirm that the whole life of a good Christian is a holy desire, which I've given you from his uh, Tractatus on uh, 1 John. Now that this holy desire refers to charity becomes clear when you see how often Augustine will equate charity's act with desire. For example, in his letter to Proba, which is about prayer, and in his discussion about how faith, hope, and charity, what their role is in praying the Our Father, he describes their acts, and he describes them as believing, hoping, desiring, credentem, sperantem, desiderantem. This corresponds uh, to uh, perfectly to Augustine's general understanding of love, uh, uh, to love is nothing, uh, he asserts, is nothing other than to desire something for the thing itself. The for itself should give us pause, but it is enough here to recognize that both hope and charity seem to imply desire. The question arises, therefore, how do hope and charity differ? This question becomes especially acute when we discover that hope and charity, it would seem, both reside in the will. St. Thomas Aquinas will offer a solution by articulating the unique character of the will's desire. Thomas Aquinas distinguishes the will's love from the love proper to the emotions or the passions of love. And if I had more time, we could go into a whole uh, analysis of what that is like, but I don't. So for Aquinas, we'll just focus on the will. For Aquinas, the will's primary act is uh, to affirm some good to someone, oneself or another. 
And so he will say here, uh, uh, let's see, did I not give you that? I don't know if I did. Um, love has a twofold tendency. Yeah. So uh, love is to will some good to someone. As such, Thomas explains that the will has, okay, I, I didn't give you that other one. Uh, so in uh, 24 6, the same uh, article, he says quite clearly, drawing on Aristotle uh, from uh, the definition of philane in the rhetoric, uh, Aquinas will say that the will's act of love is to will good to someone. And thus, as such, uh, to love, ha love has a twofold tendency towards the good that a person wishes to someone, uh, to himself or to another and towards the one uh, and towards the one to whom uh, he wishes some good. So love is essentially love for someone. It is by nature personal. This is the essence of love, proper, uh, the love proper to friendship or what Aquinas will call amor amicitiae. When we, will, when we love a person, we are willing good to that person. Rooted in this affective act, however, uh, affirmative act, is the desire for the good we will for the other. This is what Aquinas calls amor concupiscentiae, or the love proper to desire. Uh, so if I uh, wish to give you a cup of coffee, I am affirming the good of coffee, coffee to you. So I'm affirming something to you. That's the love proper to friendship. But in, uh, in doing so, I'm also desiring the coffee as a good for you. Uh, Aquinas is clear that, this, uh, that these are not two separate loves. Rather, the will's love always has two components, one of which is subordinate to the other. The love of concupiscence, the love proper to desire, is contained within the dynamism of our love of friendship for ourselves or for someone else. When we love, we are always affirming some good for someone. Most fundamentally, we affirm the very existence of our beloved, as Aquinas states uh, in a beautiful passage, the first thing that one wills, uh, the first thing that one wills for a friend is that he be and live. We will then uh, will and promote other goods for our friend, that he be virtuous, healthy, wise, grow close to the Lord. When our beloved is present and enjoying all of these goods, we rejoice in the beloved and his good. In relation to God, who lacks nothing, this willing has the character of a celebration. We celebrate and affirm his goodness. We see that throughout the psalm. The Psalms do have Psalms of desire, which are also throughout the Psalms. My soul longs uh, for the Lord like the deer that longs for the flowing streams in Psalm 42. Of course, actually the verse is reversed. Like a deer that longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O Lord. So desire is throughout the desire for God. But there's also this other often forgotten aspect of all the Psalms and the Canticles to celebrate God's goodness. But how does any of this uh, help us understand the relationship between hope and charity? It helps because Thomas discerned that in relationship to God, hope has the character of a love of desire, a love of concupiscence, while charity has the character of the love proper to friendship. Moreover, hope loves God as an absent good. Hope desires God as an absent good whom we desire to attain, while charity loves God as present, as one with whom we are united by a union of affections. Uh, so St. Thomas will uh, explain this as follows. And once again, I'll Make this larger and make myself smaller here. <laughs> um, so what is uh, Thomas saying here? Uh, love and uh, hope differ. Uh, let's see my, there we go. Love and hope differ in this way. 
Love implies a certain union between lover and beloved, while hope implies a certain motion or tendency of the appetite toward an arduous good. Union, however, is with something distinct. Now, it's very, very interesting what he's saying here. Union, however, is with something distinct. And therefore, love is directly able to consider the other with whom we are united by love, regarding him as we regard ourselves. Motion, however, is always toward an end, a terminus, properly proportioned to the moved object. And thus, hope directly considers one's own good and not that which pertains to the other. So what is going on here? Charity unites us to God as one who becomes another self. And therefore we want for that other self, we want for God, his goodness, his flourishing. Hope, however, loves God as an absent good that we want as our fulfillment. And thus, hope is a desire for union with God uh, in the community with, uh, of the blessed in heaven, which is all good. This love, this desire, which is hope, is legitimate, like a child's desire for its mother's milk. It is, however, imperfect, and it belongs properly only to this life. That's why the greatest in that hymn to love is love. Hope, faith passes away with vision, and hope passes away with full union. And yet in this life, it is animated by charity. It is according to God's love that we desire him as our fulfillment. Thus, Thomas will say that, and I'll go on to the next uh, one. Thomas will say, I'll move myself down again. Uh, he'll make the distinction between charity and hope by means of perfect and imperfect love. Perfect love is that by which someone is loved for himself as when one wills him good, the way a man loves his friend. Imperfect love is that by which one loves something not for itself, but because of the good that comes to the lover from it, as when a man loves something he desires. The first love of God pertains to charity, by which we cling to God for himself, while hope pertains to the second love, because one who hopes intends to obtain something for himself. St. Thomas, however, reminds us that although hope is a desire for God as our fulfillment, there is a way by which hope, as animated by charity, also relates to God as present. Aquinas addresses this when he affirms that hope concerns two things. And we can move this over now. So it concerns two things, the good which it intends to obtain and the help by which that good is obtained. Hope desires heaven, but through the help of Christ and the action of the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, the character of this aspect of hope is perhaps suggested uh, in the Germanic origins uh, of our word hope. Scholars who understand the etymology of our language affirm that hope is related uh, to another word, hop, both of which uh, express, seem to express uh, the an animal emotion. Now, these Germanic farmers, when they were uh, beginning to employ these words together, were no doubt thinking about the experience of uh, barn animals, uh, horses, uh, or even deer, uh, young deer, uh, dogs, the emotion of hope literally calls them to hop. So we talk about jumping for joy or leaping for joy. We have that in uh, uh, Luke's gospel. When Elizabeth describes uh, the action uh, of uh, the unborn John the Baptist. So jo uh, hope seems to be related uh, to this jumping up and down. 
Uh, now, if that's true, uh, it can perhaps help us to explain uh, an aspect of the, this twofold, twofold aspect of hope. Uh, in a dog, now some scholars like Wittgenstein and even uh, the great Alistair McIntyre will affirm that uh, animals uh, and dogs cannot hope because they cannot imagine uh, a different future. Surprisingly for these two great philosophers, their understanding of hope here has been infected by the theological virtue of hope. But as an emotion, and this is the analogy that I'm setting up, as an emotion, as Aquinas says very clearly in his study of the emotion of hope, animals do have something akin to hope. It's a universal experience. It's behind Pavlov's reaction, uh, the dogs in Pavlov's experiment. Uh, it's not that they need to uh, imagine a different future. It, it's simply that they can, they think that the future will be like the past. And the example that I like to use is the example of the dog's reaction when he hears his leash. It's not like when he sees his food on the ground. When you put the bowl of food out, the dog just goes and eats the food. You see the expression of his desire, his love for the food. When the dog jumps up and down, it's different. There is a good he wants to attain, but it's a difficult good, a good that he cannot attain on his own. He wants to go for the walk like the dog in this photo, uh, but he cannot go on the walk without the help of his master because he has no opposable thumbs, he can't open the door. That emotional animal reaction in the uh, emotion of hope helps us, can help us explain the two, the twin aspects of the virtue of hope. We desire this communal fulfillment in heaven, the joy of union with God at the celestial banquet in the heavenly kingdom and the vision of God. We desire this, but it's a desire only made possible because of the help we obtain from the master, from Christ. And it can lead, the emotion of hope can turn to despair. If the dog hears the leash and rounds the corner, jumping up and down to discover that it's not his master, but his master's wicked uh, child, uh, who's there just to torment the dog, the dog will eventually settle down and show a, an emotion of despair. We, however, in the theological grace that comes uh, it, with the theological virtue of hope, we are able to hope that this difficult good is possible to us because of what Christ does for us. It is therefore in this light uh, that we can see uh, and understand the catechism's definition of hope. And perhaps uh, in order to leave time for some questions, we can end uh, with this. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness, placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying not on our own strength, but on the help of grace, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Michael, um, for that very thoughtful, um, very textual um, talk. We really appreciate it. Um, so um, now we're going to have a few minutes for questions. So um, if anyone has a question, you can type it into the chat and then I'll respond to you. And if you'd like to unmute, you can do that. Um, but um, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask the first question, if that's all right. Um, I think often when we speak in common part, like just common talk about hope, we're often thinking not necessarily of heaven, but of other good things. So even to take like a very serious example, I mean, I think there's been a lot of discussions recently about what kind of hope can we have with war and with all the horrible things going on um, uh, just in our modern culture. Um, so, what do you think the role of hoping for 
things that are not, that hopefully will lead us to heaven, but that are just good things in life. Um, what do you think St. Thomas, how, how does he incorporate that into his treatment of hope? And then how do you think that should be part of the Christian spiritual life, do you think? Well, Aquinas practices following Aristotle, a type of ordinary language philosophy. He wants to respect how people speak. However, if you read what Aristotle says about hope, and there have been some very good recent studies uh, on uh, hope uh, among the, the pagan authors and uh, hope among uh, Aristotle uh, specifically, he, um, he's very ambivalent, Aristotle is, with regard to hope. First of all, again, uh, Elpis for him can be an expectation of either good or evil. But even, and so then when he wants to talk about expectation of good, he will often, as uh, Plato has Socrates do, uh, use a term, uh, eu elpis, so uh, well help, uh, hope, well hope, or whatever, good hope. Uh, and uh, he, when he refers to that, he recognizes uh, from experience that a lot of those who are hopeful are hopeful because they lack experience. And that as you grow in experience, you become um, uh, less uh, hopeful. Uh, hope is therefore an emotion proper to the young. And he contrasts this with real courage and talks about the two ways in which people go into battle. The young who are ignorant of the reality of battle go in full of false hopes while the really courageous know exactly what battle is, that they are going to have to attack and bear uh, blows, because those are the twofold acts. The two acts of, of courage for Aristotle uh, parallel the act of striking with a sword and then bearing with a shield. And he says it primarily is that bearing. Uh, and the New Testament authors will take that over to say that that's what Christian life unto martyrdom is. Uh, the courage of the Christian life uh, is to bear the burdens of this life. So it's a different type of hope. So I would be, um, Aquinas, I think following the Greeks here is perfectly willing to recognize that people speak of hope all the time in many different ways. It's an expectation that X, Y, or Z will arrive and that different personalities will be more hopeful about good outcomes than others. But he would share with Aristotle that the person of practical wisdom uh, is not necessarily very hopeful on that level. They hope in Christ, they hope in eternal life, but the Maccabees, the seven sons of the one mother, I think for Aquinas is a far more accurate portrayal of the joy-filled hope of the Christian. Uh, and Paul in uh, Ephesians 5 is very clear. It, he, we, are, we are full of joy because of the glory uh, in God that is to be ours. And therefore we can even joy in suffering. Because by that, by our configuration to the cross, we can advance towards that. Uh, but I think uh, Aquinas would, uh, would understand very easily, to use an American example, why someone like Lincoln, who by personality was more depressive and not full of uh, the emotion of hope, why he would become such a wise person of practical judgment about others, about their character, and about how to affect long-term change as opposed to uh, short-term attempts at change. So I think uh, he would recognize how we speak, but be very wary of having a false hopes. Wow, yeah, that's, that's re really interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. Um, Paul actually has a question that's kind of a, a, a sort of natural follow-up. Um, if we don't want to be like foolish young people and hope in things we shouldn't, um, but we also want to have hope in our ultimate end, um, what role should um, hope have in the Christian life, do you think? 
Well, it's it is uh, it's at the heart of the Christian life, but it's hope of heaven. Uh, I mean, I see this everywhere, and it's and it's also something that we too often neglect is its relationship to patient endurance, to courage. And I think Paul is very clear here. Hope grows through growth in the Christian version of courage, which is patient endurance. Uh, and uh, Paul uses this moral term. Uh, dokime, so that it be a that your character be proven, that you become truly what you're called to be through these sufferings. Uh, but it's not a dour thing. It produces true joy to live for the kingdom. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, relationships. Why do so many relationships between in courtship between men and women go afoul? because the couple don't have their hopes well ordered. Uh, the, uh, there's that wonderful uh, phrase by uh, Miguel Dunomuno when he was uh, in his 80s. And he said, uh, when I see, uh, when, my, when my wife's leg brushes up against me, I no longer feel anything. But when her leg hurts, mine does too. Now, Unamuno is talking about a lifetime of shared life, ordered not to superficial things, but to those things that are lasting. And the couples who love each other for eternity uh, can uh, progress together. And then the trauma of seeing the signs of approaching death on the beloved. I think many marriages Many men, when they see uh, their wives symbolically uh, signaling uh, the, the autumn to come, um, uh, it, moving towards winter of, the, of one's life, uh, they can't handle it. And they turn towards uh, someone half their age and stupid to try to not see the truth that they are on their way towards eternal life, uh, whether for joy or sorrow. But those who really hope, who have cultivated all their lives through the courage of patient endurance, real hope, well then uh, seeing the, uh, the flower of youth go away in their beloved is actually an added incentive to grow closer so that they can become like Unamuno, so united in their movement towards the Lord uh, that there's joy even uh, in the in the winter of their lives together. So I think uh, hope is essential to the Christian life. It's at the heart of the Christian life, uh, but it is it has to be well centered. And this was our long going uh, argument with the Marxists, you know, and uh, those philosophers who've been influenced by Marx want to make a kind of secular virtue of hope, uh, but it's a false hope. And I recommend I didn't have time to go into the Book of Wisdom. The Book of Wisdom really is a preparation for the arrival of Christ. And it's very clear to me why the rabbis, uh, when they were uh, preparing the Mesoretic text, why they had to reject the Septuagint, because the, the Book of Wisdom is, is like the New Testament. It so clearly proclaims the mystery of Christ and his cross and the Eucharist. But in there, one of the things that the author of the Book of Wisdom pursues is the mystery of hope and true hope versus false hope. And uh, he attacks the nations for turning towards false hopes. And the just, even though they die, even though they look as if they were uh, rejected by uh, their contemporaries, the just are in the hands of God and their, uh, their, um, uh, their reward will be immortality and peace in the Lord. So, yeah, I think... Uh, there's a real challenge for us to live, to be a people of hope and to live hope and the, the joy of hope. Right. Yeah. Um, but what would you say to the objection that this account you've laid out that really emphasizes the heavenly reality takes us to out of the present, you know, like that something about this focus, um, it, mm -hmm. it, it's detached from the present reality we live in. One of the things that's not often uh, uh, 
notice because of the way in which Thomas is translated is that Thomas does not use the word means the way in which we do in English. If you look at almost every occurrence in the analysis of human action where the word means is presented, what Aquinas actually says is that which is ad finem. And he, he only likes the analogy of um, local motion to a very limited extent when he's analyzing human action. The human act here and now, what the Greeks talked about uh, described as the kalos, the morally beautiful act in the kairos, in the critical present moment, participates in the end. Like some form of forms of Asian thought, if you take Thomas very seriously, you discover that the way is the end. The way participates in the end. So that's why charity does have priority. The act of love participates already in heaven. So it's not that living the theological virtues will somehow remove people from this world. It will help them instead to love and act in this world in a way that is ordered to eternity. And that's a very different thing. Um, it's like that funny expression, if you don't know where you're going, it's better, uh, better not uh, run there fast. I mean, it's, the, it's better to go slowly on the right way than fast in the wrong way, which is an Augustinian expression. And to recognize that we are via Torres is not to discount this world, but it's to rightly live in this world. Uh, and when people are loved that way, when you love the person for the union that you will be able to enjoy only in heaven, that brings joy now to them and to you. And when you love them as an end somehow attainable in this life, you make them and yourselves miserable. Uh, there's a beautiful thing. Uh, the uh, missionaries at the, uh, in Paris who were preparing to go to what we know as Vietnam, uh, they got permission to correspond with uh, Carmelite nuns in the Carmel in Lisieux in Normandy. And one uh, fortunate seminarian who's preparing to spend the rest of his life, leave France forever and spend the rest of his life in uh, uh, Vietnam, starts a correspondence with Therese. And he, of course, as any normal person would, fell madly in love with Therese and started to go to Lisieux and wanted to see her. Therese never attacked him for his love, but she simply said, he wants to live his heaven now. So that's the character of this hope, to love people and act for their good here and now, but in a way that's ordered to eternity and not to seek here what you cannot attain or that what you can attain only in heaven and you attain here only as a foretaste. A marriage is a sacrament. It's not a consummation of the communion of heaven. It is a sign that participates in the communion of heaven. And everything about our life on this earth is the same. Those who try to turn uh, our civil life into some type of uh, utopia will either become bitter or they'll become false. Uh, but if they see it as a limited, uh, as a uh, Teresa of Avila would say, a night in an uncomfortable inn, uh, then they can start to work in this life with more realistic expectations. Wow, that's, um, I think that gives us all a lot to think about there. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we're out of time, too, um, <laughs> for questions. But thank you so much for your lecture, Father Michael. Um, I'm just going to make a few announcements before we sign off. Um, the next talk in our virtue series is on temperance. It's called Acquiring the True Virtue of Temperance with Sister Catherine Joseph Drosty, and that will be on April 20th at 7 p.m. Um, same, same time, same place. Um, and to find out more about other lectures from the Thomistic Institute, please visit our website, 
angelicum.it slash domestic domestic slash institute. Thank you so much. Um, and God bless. Have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night, Joshua.